is born in shackles, born stripped of all dignity. Absalom Jones was bound determined that he would one day be free. Blessed Absalom leads us, guides us in the bonds of you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And I welcome all of you this evening into our conversation in celebration of the first Black Episcopal priest, Absalom Jones. Today, at a time in our nation of racial reckoning on the one hand, and a resurgence of white supremacist realities on the other, and at a time when our church, our Episcopal church has committed itself to working to foster beloved communities where all people may experience dignity and abundant life and see themselves and others as beloved children of God. We come at this time on this evening to reflect on the significance of Absalom Jones in this time for our nation and in this time in our church. Absalom Jones, founder of St. Thomas of African Episcopal Church in Philadelphia, the first Black Episcopal congregation, and the first Black Episcopal priest who was ordained in 1802, and whose feast day we celebrate on the anniversary of his death, February 13th, 1818. Joining me in this conversation this evening, are three of the bishops of our church who have been in the forefront in witness toward social justice and racial justice. And so I am so pleased to introduce to you Bishop Kevin Nichols, Bishop in the Diocese of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, Bishop Shannon McVean Brown, Bishop in the Diocese of, for the Diocese of Vermont, and Bishop Robert Wright, Bishop in the Diocese for the Diocese of Atlanta. Thank you all for joining us this evening in this important conversation. I want to begin maybe with an easy question for you to get us started in this conversation. And that question is this, why do you think that it is important for the Episcopal Church to celebrate Absalom Jones. And I would ask each of you to answer that question. And uh, Bishop McVean Brown, why don't we start with you? Sure. Well, first of all, I'll just say I need encouragement and reminders all the time of the legacy on which I stand. Mm -hmm. um, and so as an African American uh, person in this church, I need to remind myself and others, we've been here a long time, a part of this, this history. But the other thing is that, you know, it shows us where we came from and still how far we have to go. And everybody needs to know about just the, the difficult history of Absalom Jones and how he came to be in service in this church, be ordained in this church, lest we forget the work that we're called to today. 
Thank you, Bishop Wright. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dean Kelly. Uh, good to be with all of you. I just wanna underscore before we get going, um, uh, that wonderful hymn that was so wonderfully rendered by our dear recently departed uh, brother, uh, the Reverend Dr. Harold uh, T. Lewis, uh, who would be delighted at a panel and a conversation like this. Um, uh, why should we celebrate Absalom? I mean, I think what Bishop Shannon has said is, is exactly right. I think the other thing we need to do is we, we need to remember the great cloud of witnesses of which Absalom is a part of. We need to remember the grit and grace uh, that sort of come through who he is. Um, but I, I think one of the things we need to remember too is he was able to stay focused on Jesus amidst the failures of the church. And mm -hmm. so he does some amazing theology, doesn't he? He's, mm -hmm. he's able to see the church for what she really is, which is a bunch of sinners, all of us stumbling forward. Uh, many missteps, not nearly as courageous as we ought to be given the life and witness of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, but he's not undone by that. He finds a way to stay sort of resourced by the witness uh, of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to sort of do what I would call really revolutionary work, which is to grow something, to invite all kinds, uh, commit to learning uh, and, uh, and care, and to talk in terms of Africa at that time as something really positive, a heritage uh, to be sort of laid claim to. And so uh, I think he needs to be celebrated because of the bold theology and bold witness that he, uh, that he offers us. Thanks, Mr. Wright. And I'm gonna follow up on a lot of that in a minute, but I wanna give uh, Bishop Nichols a chance to respond to that question. And I'm gonna invite uh, each of you to stay off mute, if you will, so this becomes uh, more conversational. And I, uh, I trust that you don't have anything in the background and so that we can, can engage in true conversation. Bishop Nichols. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dean Kelly. Uh, what an honor it is to be with uh, each of you. Uh, let me just say uh, two passages, scripture passages came to mind when I think of uh, Absalom Jones. The first is, it's that last line from Psalm 88 that we hear at the Good Friday liturgy. And it, and it says, I am reckoned as one in the tomb. My mm -hmm. only companion is darkness. And, and, and I just I wonder how did he overcome it? And, and the, second, the second passage that comes to mind is from Galatians. And it says, I've been crucified with Christ. And the life I live now is not my own. Christ is living in me. It is a life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And, and it's, it's that shackled, crucified life that he lived. And yet he allowed resurrection hope to dawn. Um, and and his 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 gathering together, folk, to say we will we will not take this any longer. That first stand against injustice is a reminder for me of how I and we need to stand for justice in this moment. So it is a it is a clarion call for me to look deep within. So so let me dig deeper into that. And, and each of you have mentioned his, his legacy and relationship to uh, his, his sort of commitment in spite of, uh, uh, of it all to justice and to continue to fight for justice, even in midst of the very many barriers he had uh, to even folks disrespecting his humanity. But we know, right? And so I want to dig deep into that legacy for, for our church. Because we know that the story of Absalom Jones and St. Thomas Episcopal Church really begins when he and his friend Richard Allen <coughs> founded the Free African Society, right? In 1787. Now, this society, like others of its kind, were formed partly as a response to the exclusion practiced by whites in offering social services, including white churches to black persons. It is out of this society that St. Thomas and Bethel uh, AME Church were formed. So in as much as two churches were born out of the Free African Society, what is its legacy, that Free African Society, for us in terms of what it means to be church? What's the challenge? What, what are we to, to learn from that legacy? 
who wants to begin there? Come on, uh, Bishop Wright, get well, us started. I, well, I, I can tell you, I really like that question because I, I think that uh, we remember since uh, Bishop Kevin wants to bring up the Bible, I like that. Uh, we, we, we remember that in the Exodus, uh, what was needed was more than just a, a river crossing. Um, yeah. it, you know, it took many, it took many, many years to put all the slave in and it took, you know, active, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, behaviors and practices to, to get the slave out. So when we see Absalom uh, and Richard working, you know, as partners uh, for the benefit of their community, you know, they are laying claim to agency, um, uh, you know, while racism, uh, white supremacy is real. We know it's real ever since we, we got here in 1619. Um, you know, there's no victimhood in them. There is, there is a sense that uh, a great injustice has been done and, uh, and accounts are not settled. And at the same time, we have agency today to do something about it. And so that's what I like about them. I mean, they are not looking for a rescue. They are not looking for anybody on a white horse uh, or anything else white to rescue them. They are looking what the, to what they have in their hands. And so the Free Af African Society is an amazing uh, you know, expression of that. Not, not only that, but I mean, they are working on abolition. They, they, are, they are mindful that they are connected to others who are yet to be free. Um, and so I, I think that is that is really, really important. And so 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 their, their spirituality is not performative, you know, for Sunday. Right. I mean, when you think about Absalom's, uh, you know, his witness with his own family, I mean, you, you're thinking about a radical other centeredness that gives him moral authority, you know, not only in his own home, but in a pulpit, but in the community. And so I, I think that um, I think we got to lay claim to some of that. I mean, they, they are walking back. Um, years of br brutal injustice, et cetera, by laying claim to the agency that they have in the, in, in, in the, in the days ahead of them. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. So here, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Bishop. I, I, uh, you know, um, I, I just, Bishop Kevin, thank you for bringing up that Psalm because I just thought, well, you know, hmm, darkness is their only, is his only companion. Well, yes. Darkness was where he found Jesus, where he found God, the Holy Spirit, pushing him forward. They they found that in each other. Yeah. And so there, you know, it well, yes, <laughs> that's how he, he could keep going. And you know, for me, thinking of that example of being present holistically to a community, not just, you know, I don't know where we went wrong with thinking that it's just about Sunday morning. Yeah. And I know that for the black church, that that is the tradition that, you know, it's not just about Sunday morning. It's that it's, this is a whole body endeavor. And so how can we not <laughs> address social justice issues or social needs? And, you know, we're busy trying to figure, oh, so what is the church gonna be in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, black Episcopalians need to relearn that perhaps because you know we, we haven't necessarily held on to that part of the legacy but we can all you know what's old is new again but it's always been good always been the right path yeah so i want to build on that uh which you both said and and and, and could you respond to this you said one uh this claim of agency two and i like this the church is about more than sunday morning right and when Absalom Jones and Richard Allen got kicked out of, uh, or they left uh, uh, St. Uh, St. George's uh, Methodist Church, you know, they formed a free African society. They didn't, they didn't go out and it was grounded theologically and spiritually and biblically, but it was, they weren't arguing about ritual and liturgy and they formed a society to take care of the folk. Uh, duh, and so what does that tell us? And I'm just struck how some of our debates in the church, particularly time of COVID have been, how are we going to celebrate the Eucharist and all of that? And people were dying. And, and so what does that tell us? Not simply uh, Bishop Brown about the Black church. That's the best of our Black tradition. But what does it tell us about what it means to be church? 
Well, Kelly, let me just say a few words about church. You know, I, I'm standing right now 54 miles from that church. I mean, the diocese that I serve um, until like 1870 was, was we were one. You know, that, that was our community. And yet I just had a conversation a few days ago with one of the, the great uh, social justice icons in the city of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And, and she tells me about her husband, Bill, who, who attended the cathedral. And in 1950, he wanted to be a priest. You know, 150 years and 54 miles from where it all began, we still can't get it right because of race. She said he could never, he could never make his way. Uh, he used to tell everybody that he, that he bowled at the cathedral. And she said he didn't bowl at the cathedral. He put the pins up for the white elite of Bethlehem steel. Um, you know, so speaking the truth about the realities of, of what has not changed as well and, and looking at the possibilities of what must change if we're going to build the beloved community, which is, which is damn hard work. It is not comfort. Um, it's not niceties. It, it is getting in the community. And, and, and it's people like Esther Lee and her continue to fight for justice, you know, at 90 years of age. She is what inspires me and points me back to Absalom Jones. Yeah, Bishop Wright, look like you wanted to jump in. No, I, 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 I want to say amen to everything that I've heard. I mean, I, I think that we got to go, you know, one, one step deeper for this to be a, of any good use to us. I mean, I think, you know, I was just spent, spent a day with a clergy conference uh, here in Atlanta with Will Willimon, and we were talking about, um, you know, what, uh, you know, we defang the gospel, uh, he says, you know, within the first three minutes of taking the pulpit, right? So we, we stand between the people of God and the gospel and make it okay. We make Jesus into a milk cow rather than the raging bull that he is. I, I, I think one of the things we've got we've to do is we've got to, you know, we're talking about things we need to talk about it, but none of this talking is a substitute for courage. You know, mm -hmm. I think when you see Richard Allen, you think you, you see Absalom, there's a moral courage. It, it's not a it's not a it's not contempt for anybody. I mean, I think we need to be very careful. Here. It's not contempt for anybody because I, I have never read, you know, what I have read of Absalom. I've never read him sort of throwing anybody under the bus, but he has a moral clarity, certainty and urgency. And I, I think this is what we need to be talking about. And, and just to start the party off right here, let me just let me just cause some trouble. You know, I don't buy this notion of social justice at all, at all. When people ask me to talk about social justice, I tell, what is that? I don't know what that is. I know that it, it is treated as if it is a, a building addition to the gospel of Jesus oh, I Christ. Know. I don't know what the hell that is. What I know about it is that the gospel, uh, as Brueggemann has so wonderfully said, is that there's an irreducibility of God and the irreducibility of neighbor. And beyond that, I don't know what the hell we're talking about. So, you know, we, we, it's code, a dog whistle for talking about black people. Right. I don't know what social justice is. Here's what I know. I know that if somehow Jesus has, uh, you know, intervened in your life, it, it ought to increase your compassion for neighbor, especially for neighbor in the ditch. I read that somewhere in the book. And Absalom embodies this. And so I think that in Absalom and Richard and, and, and their, you know, and their mentees down the road, you get a moral clarity, which is not, not, um, which is not angry or is not filled with rage, but it's filled with a clarity that I'm not sure that we, we, we bring forward all the time. What's interesting as you say that uh, uh, about Absalom Jones, and, and I, I do want to even uh, get you under the spot, think about what he would say about our church today. Yeah. But I remember at the dedication, right, of uh, St. Thomas African uh, uh, Episcopal Church, uh, the priest that preached there, uh, McCrawl, I think was his name, really gave a very patronizing sermon and talked about the way in which uh, Absalom and all of the black congregants, the Africans, ought to be very grateful and thankful, et cetera, et cetera, uh, <laughs> even as he continued to dehumanize him toward the end of the sermon. And what's interesting, uh, uh, Bishop Wright, and what you say is that Absalom Jones in his sermon showed no hatred, yeah, no malice, but he responded with the gospel. Mm. 
and 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 what 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 are we to learn right from that that even in the midst even when he and Richard Allen uh uh and the Free African Society responded to the yellow fever uh uh crisis when everyone else was leaving and plus they were told uh by Benjamin Rush and others that black people didn't get yellow fever they were then Right. And, and so they stayed and they responded and many of them died. But then they were later blamed the black community for spreading yellow fever. Mm -hmm. What are we to. And yet again, Absalom Jones responded not out of hatred, uh, but out of this sense of love that was abiding in courageous justice. What, what do we learn from that? What are, what are we to learn? What would he think of who we are today? I've never. I don't known know what he would. Any of you to be shocked. I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think, I think he he would probably say, "Stop, you know, celebrating my day when when you can't do better, when you haven't done better, because you can do better." And you know, Bishop Rob, I like how you said, you know, social justice. <laughs> that why you know why do we use that word? Because because we don't have. You know, I didn't, growing up the way that I did, and it was in the Episcopal Church, I didn't learn those words until later just to help people understand because, again, I, I use that word holy. We don't have the right word for it, but for some reason, mm -hmm. you know, we want all of this, this life of following Jesus to be easy and tame. And then at the same time, though, I, you know, it's good I wasn't there because I would, they would have killed me because I just, Maybe I would have been different. I don't know. Because I could not have done what he did. Because I don't owe anybody this black body. That's what I, I mean. That is a thing that I have said increasingly in this pandemic. Um, that I just, I don't know anybody that, you know, I'm, I'm going to, when I go out to protest, uh, not because I have to. It's somebody else's turn sometimes. I, I have some other things to do. Look, I'm, I'm in Vermont. So I'm doing some. <laughs> Yeah, that maybe I'll quit now. Oh. But second widest state, so I, you know, it's not like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yeah, but I like what you you said. It's somebody else's turn, and yes, Absalom Jones and Richard Allen stepped up in the Free African Society. And here's what we know, and they report, they were caring not just for the black community, uh, particularly during its time of yellow fever, they were caring for the white community that other white churches wouldn't care for. Sure. And they said the people who responded the most were the black poor, right? To the white poor. So what is the message, uh, Bishop Nichols, I'm gonna pick on you because you know. I know. Uh, well, other folk need to step up. Well, they, they do need to step up. I'm, I'm just going to speak as a newcomer to this. I mean, I, Kelly knows a bit of this, but, you know, I'm a newcomer. It, if it wasn't for 23 years ago when we adopted our fourth child, who's now a 250-pound man of color, um, I would have absolutely no clue. Um, so I am just a learner. I'm an ally. Um, and, and I know, first of all, that soul work is needed. And for other white allies like me, especially if you've got power authority, um, you know, this is a moment where we just, we must go deeper and, and we've got to go deeper and we've got to find ways to walk together. Um, you know, um, what, what I learned um, as my son moved into his middle years was that all the privilege, all the authority, all the accumulated wealth, even the, the finest prep schools, Episcopal prep schools, couldn't protect him from racial injustice and systemic injustice. Um, that's all race. And so um, we do have to find a way to come together in this. And, and as an ally, um, I'm finding at times, I, I just need to listen more to folk like you. Um, which will help me to see where I need to walk. Uh, so, Dean Kelly, you, you said that we could just, we could start talking. Can we just start talking together yeah, and stare? Talking. You know, the other but, thing that I, I want to say, you know, I, I want to say that, uh, that Absalom is a, is a moral exemplar, right? And I, I want to lay claim to that. 
And I want to say that not only for blacks and whites as well, but I, I want to just get real down in the weeds with you yes. for just a second. And if there's anybody here listening who is part of a diocese that has a UBE chapter uh, or an annual Absalom, Absalom Jones celebration, you know, I, it's been my experience and I've, I've had a chance to address uh, about 50 dioceses uh, in this church uh, in, in one uh, level of clergy training or the other. And, and I, I wonder if we're really uh, rendering unto Absalom Jones a, 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 a sacrifice worthy of his example. So for instance, let me just say what I mean by that. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but we're just going to, we're going to say it, you know, we get together and we sing, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, songs of Zion, if you will, and all that's lovely. And then before COVID, we had a nice little meal and it's an old homes week and certainly fellowship has its place. But it, I'm struck that not a lot of people who have chapters of UBE are actually putting anybody through college. That's right. There, 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 there's not a financial component here. There's not, there's not a real serious life-changing work. And, and I think we've got to celebrate these folks because they changed lives. I mean, that was the gospel. It was, like, it was, it was not talk, it was do, right? And, and, and I think that uh, there's an invitation here for us to rethink uh, our UBE work, um, our, our, our diocesan celebrations of Absalom Jones, uh, et cetera. And, you know, and, and let me be clear but, and try to be kind. Uh, in many cases, uh, we're, we, we go around and we ask the white diocesan bishop for money to celebrate Absalom Jones. No disrespect, but I'm saying these are the facts of the matter. Uh, and and, and it, it seems like when I read Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, that would be unusual for them. That's right. What would have been usual for them is for them to, to take up amongst their community to get some serious work done, to change some lives, et cetera, to buy people out of the bondages of their age, and which makes us wonder what are the bondages of our own ages. And so, so I, I just I want to say uh, to to folks is that um, when we talk about white supremacy, and we need to, we have also got to talk about the other side of that, and that is uh, the ways in which uh, people of color have colluded with white supremacy. Right. And so what is the internalized component here? And so when we look throughout uh, Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, we get a model of self-determination that is consistent and underscored and empowered by the gospel. No, as, as they would say, that is exactly right. And preach it. And that's what the Free African Society was all about. Uh, and indeed, it was formed right out of a collection from black people. Exactly. But poor, poor black people. For poor, well, yeah. If you were black at that right. time, you were <laughs> you you were poor, uh, duh, and and continue uh, to be put upon. Uh, but I I want to hear get you all to weigh in on another aspect of what you just said. Uh, they were talking about the legacy of, of Absalom Jones. It is easy to celebrate and put his feast day on the calendar and celebrate Absalom one day. And so, and, 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 and so you've gotten to a question I want to uh, get to, how we should, how are we continuing as a church to collude in the very uh, system structures, realities uh, that indeed compelled, forced uh, Absalom Jones and others to find a way to support and sustain their communities and others. How are we continuing to collude as a church in the very realities that Absalom Jones had to struggle against and try to resist? That's, that's, that's uh, my, my, my first question. And then you raise this issue and you all can weigh in at, at any place. You raise this issue, of course, of our black uh, uh, schools, HBCUs, right? And we know that one of the uh, significant aspects of uh, the Free African Society and the black church has been the support of uh, black higher education, HBCUs, and in, in, in our Episcopal church is letting those things uh, go. I've turned our back on our HBCUs when we know that those were, that those were the institutions that allowed black people to study uh, to, and to train black people. So how are we really turning our back <laughs> on the legacy? as a church that was Absalom Jones 
and continuing to collude in the realities that turned its back on Absalom Jones. Ooh, all right. <laughs> And the church, you know, <laughs> you know, well, this is this is a new experience for me over these last uh, few years of, of being, you know, I've, I've only been a bishop not even three years yet, and I have to say, you know, Black History Month, Absalom Jones celebration. I mean, how how do you do that <laughs> in Vermont? Yeah. Um, how do I do that, you know, when there's so few of me in this church and even, you know, even in the state? And so, you know, it for me, it's a bit of a longing. And so um, I think I'm going to uh, spread that to a, a sort of a different answer in that I decided that for this month, when I would normally be with other people that look like me, you know, reflecting on, you know, ways that we are being um, convicted <laughs> and also ways that we're celebrating, you know, this, this history and this legacy that we've been passed on. So I'm just, you know, I'm taking time that I wouldn't normally take to read, to reflect, and I'm not apologizing. I mean, you know, I, I have to at least take that time and to remember, okay, this is what I'm, I'm about, what we're about. And you know, whenever I can, having these opportunities to speak. So I'm glad to be here tonight. But I, I just think, I, I don't, I feel like we should be farther along as a church. Maybe that's what I want to say. I mean, I, I'm, I'm disturbed that there's so many firsts still. Why are we in this place now? Um, you know, I could just, I could just hear you, the three of you speak. I, I, I want to add, though, that um, one of the things that drew me, Kelly, to EDS was particularly the way in which, uh, as an entity, you look at complex world challenges. You know, when you say to students, there are two questions, you know, what, what kind of church does the world need and what do faith leaders need to, to face those challenges, this notion of transformative leadership, um, and how do we align from a missional perspective uh, and partner to be, you know, those seed beds for justice. Um, I, I, I just continue to to be amazed at how little work is is done. Um, you know, there there when I arrived in the diocese of Bethlehem, and forgive me, but there was there was no one of color in leadership, and I'm talking council and standing committee and deputations and, um, and and there are folk around us and in some of our churches but th there was just nothing done to to lift up and to lead um, so we we just have failed uh, starting a racial justice and reconciliation um, commission or committee it came out of George Floyd and the horror of that moment um, and, and folk are starting to gain some traction, but um, we just have, we have so much to do. Um, and, and yet I am so hopeful because of leaders like the three of you and folk that are on this call with us tonight, uh, who, who in the spirit of Absalom Jones continue um, to give us new ways to, to walk out of this darkness and this crucified light, which gives me incredible hope. I, I, I don't know how, how to expand the good work that was done early on and, and, and maybe lost, but, um, but I surely want to be a part of it. Dr. King, Dr. King uh, um, in his letter from the Birmingham jail, which really should be the 67th book of the Bible, um, yeah. uh, uses the word disappointment 10 times. And every time that he uses the word disappointment, it is, it is in response to some um, insipidness of the church, right? He's speaking about the church, right? And so, you know, I mean, I, I think we have to try to meet people where they are, but, you know, it seems like the normative expression of response to George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery here in Georgia and other places is to start a book club. Right, right. 
And it is, it is telling that Absalom Jones doesn't start a book club. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and so, you know, what we know, what we know, you talked about leadership, uh, Bishop Kevin, um, you know, one of the things we know is the first task of leadership is to address tough problems, especially problems people would rather avoid. Right. Yeah. I mean, Jesus does this. This is the adaptive nature of his work is that he refuses to be bought off with technical challenges. He wants to get right to the heart and the heart is adaptive challenges, isn't it? And, you know, what we're talking about is an American situation. It's been the, it's our founding DNA, 1619 from the, uh, you know, and, and we in the Episcopal Church ought to lay a special claim to that because, uh, you know, among the very first people that came, that 20 some odd Negroes, as it's said, 20 some odd Negroes from what we know as Angola, uh, were uh, baptized as, uh, as Anglicans. And so the, among the very first Africans in America are Anglicans. And so this is our work. This is our work. We are first to this. Uh, and like uh, Bishop Shannon said, we should be a little further along. And so we have to, we have to interrogate why we're not. And, and I refuse to believe that it's simply a deficit of information. Uh, I mean, if it was just a deficit of information, then we ought to have more book studies. But I am sure that it's not <laughs> just a deficit of information. Uh, what, what that is, is that's a placation, right? That's what that is. And we ought to be honest about that. And, and you know, the, so, so I think that uh, we have to repent. The church has to repent. Um, and I think we have to be willing to risk something. You know, Dr. King did say in that letter from the Birmingham jail, they said, we will become an irre irrelevant social club if we're not careful. And I'm afraid that is uh, in many ways what we have become and are becoming. Um, now there's George Floyd by the blood of the martyrs, you know, has, has woken some of us up and others. And so I was, uh, got a chance to talk to John Lewis not long before he died. And John Lewis was encouraged that in the marches in response to the heinous murder of, uh, of George Floyd that he saw, and this is what John Lewis said, that he saw uh, more people that who were, who were not black marching. And so that, that woke us up. And so what we have to do is we have to maximize you know, the blood of these martyrs and really just not waste time here and get it said. And I, I think that the other last thing I'll say too is, is that I think there's a spirit of fear in the church. There's a fear of church, a spirit of fear. And so we are, we are selling our souls to keep a few people in the church. Uh, and, uh, and it is costing our, us uh, the moral clarity and authority of our witness. And, and that in no way amplifies or affirms uh, Absalom Jones's ministry. Yeah, it's as if, you know, oh, go ahead. I see you. I see you. Go, go ahead, Bishop Shannon. I, I'm sorry. Well, you know, and I, I think about, you know, after George Floyd was killed and then how it did awaken so many people and um, being in the pandemic and being in this setting uh, um, white people in the Diocese of Vermont and in the state, even, you know, like African-Americans, I mean, there, there are, you know, a bunch of immigrant um, populations in the state where we get some more color, but people, for some reason, it's like, oh, wow, it, it, it's really real. And they had time to actually sit. So it, it really is, some of it is information for some people. They needed to, to hear and see more. Um, it was the people were ready to talk, frankly. And, you know, nobody's really watching. Yeah, sort of, I guess I am. Um, but it, in, in some sense, it became personal for them to be more engaged, to know more, to stay in the conversations. There are congregations who, because they're engaging in this conversation, are losing members yeah. in Vermont so, so and me, so it's work I mean it's something <laughs> no I'm sorry I didn't want to cut you off uh, yeah. uh, at all so but to your point of people are losing members because they're engaging in this conversation and, and, it, and it reminds me you know as, as we're talking about this story of absent we can we can romanticize the story but uh or we can be challenged by it and learn the hard truths of the story. What is the role of the church, the Episcopal church? And really, it, we are in a time where people don't want to hear 
the true story. We are in a time when uh, this, this, the, our history and the depth and the truth of our history uh, is being challenged because we don't want people to feel uncomfortable, white children to feel uncomfortable if they have to hear the true story of an Absalom uh, and others. What is the responsibility of the daggone church at this <laughs> time when we have this debate over critical race theory, which is really a is really white supremacy standing its ground and saying, no, 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 no. We are not going to open ourselves up to a different gaze. We do not want to hear this story. And, and it is, uh, you talked about social justice being a cold word uh, for not talking about racial justice. All of these arguments uh, surrounding critical race theory are really uh, just cold words, if we will, or ma masking the fact that white supremacy is standing its epistemological kind of uh, ground. I haven't heard the church speak out on this. We're talking about someone like Absalom who had moral courage. What's the church's role? How can this debate continue on without the church speaking out? Uh, where we are in the road. I'm not quiet about it. I know that I'm not quiet about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say, you know, I've been trying to call out my little quarter of the world, which is allyship, but just saying, you know, you, you can't be an ally um, and, you know, speak against particular education in schools and be more worried about your white children. I mean, it, you just, you, you can't be an ally and do that. You, you, you can't be an ally and not being outraged by the death of, of black youth uh, each and every day. You, you can't be an ally and enact voting rights um, that push down one group of folk. You just, you can't do it. Uh, and, and for that matter, you can't be an ally and support an insurrection or, or, or you know, say that it was horrible in the beginning and then walk it back. Um, I, I think folk are speaking out about, um, about how we have to shift and, and the words that we need to speak. Um, and, and I think the challenge is for someone like me who is a newcomer, um, finding my courage in the midst of this uh, is something that I have to, to pray for and, and really lean on others uh, to grow into. So no. I wanted, when you say you can't be an ally, and, and, and Bishop Rob, jump in after I just say this. Uh, can, we, can we truly celebrate Absalom and his legacy if we aren't doing those things that uh, you've uh, just suggested? Is it hypocrisy to to lift Absalom Jones up, like sort of like we lift up Martin Luther King on Martin Luther King <laughs> holiday and right. the, the contradictions and the hypocrisy. Go ahead, uh, uh, Bishop Rock. Well, I was gonna say, I was gonna just, to, I, I was gonna pull something from what Bishop Kevin just said. I, I think he said something very important there. And I, I think that uh, for anybody who's listening, I think one of the things that we, we do sometimes is we're a bit unimaginative in our own prayer life. And so, so he said, we ought to be praying. So pray for what? I mean, pray for prayer. I mean, pray for courage, pray yeah. for courage, right? I mean, pray for courage. I mean, and not, not all of us are, are, the, are the kind of Davids who could face down Goliath, right? But, but you know, so, so maybe that's part of what we pray for this Lent. Maybe, maybe this Lent, this, this season soon to come is, is, is 40 days for us to talk about, you know, with God, to have a conversation with God about courage. Uh, what does what kind of courage does fidelity require, Lord? And and you know, um, meet me where I'm at. I've, I've got to, I've got to find my 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 courage. And so I, I like it that we we are the church and we talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that is that is to to sort of uh, to to enable um, you know the righteous purposes of God, partner with the righteous purposes of God in the real world. So so prayer is important uh, is important there. I, I want to also say that. Um, uh, you know, it, this is, this is, um, so, so Absalom Jones and Richard Allen actually run towards yellow fever. I mean, right. I, I think when you, when you read the account, they run towards yellow fever. They don't. So, so, so we, we have to, we have, there's a, there's a Norse word. We, we know anger. Whenever we start talking about this, we start we, uh, and black folks and white folks, their allies get animated. We say, uh Oh, they're angry. But I, I would, I would beg you to do a word study. The word anger, A N G E R comes from the root A N G, which is a Norse word. That's N O R S E as in Viking. 
and and the and the and the root of anger is is that I feel your dignity violation so viscerally that I have to drop what I'm doing and get involved in the correction of your dignity violation. So 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 the anger is actually. Uh, it's, it's an expression of deep compassion, not Facebook compassion where we like something or Instagram uh, compassion where we, and it doesn't cost us anything. And so I think when we see, we see Absalom and, uh, and Richard running towards yellow fever, they themselves don't have it and their right. families are safe, but they're, they're running to this because they, they understand, again, this irreducibility of neighbor, right? So they understand that if my neighbor is suffering, then I am suffering. And so I, I think one of the things we've got to do, all of us, black, white, orange, and pink is, is, is recognize, uh, and, and it's unflattering, uh, but the degree that I am comfortable with suffering that's around me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We got to be real about that. And then we got to give that to God and the power of the Holy Spirit, no guilt and shame. That's just a, a worthless cul-de-sac. Get out of that and say, okay, Lord, uh, what can I do for you? I would remind us too, and this is why worship is so important. I mean, it's fascinating to me that the centerpiece of all this is worship, right? They didn't leave the church and just do a secular society, right? It, it, the church very much undergirded it, you know, resourced it, right? And so, you know, so, so the wor worship of the true and living God is one that it helps the blinders fall off. You know, it's, it's how, how we get the actual exodus in our spirit, right? Is, is that we really sort of bend ourselves toward freedom. We find that, we find that in, uh, uh, in worship. And when we do that, what ends up happening is, is that uh, it becomes less about the color of the neighbor and just about the neighbor. And so whether in, we're in Vermont or Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, or Atlanta, Georgia, uh, it, it ends up being a spiritual springboard uh, to care for. We got white rural folks uh, right here who are catching hell in Georgia. Mm. Now they've had a different historical journey, but they are catching hell and they are getting pimped by politicians of both stripes in the same way that black and Latino people are getting pimped right now. And so, so this is not, you know, just to talk about black folks, but it is amazing to see how it ends up being a springboard and the horizon gets wider and wider and wider. Miguel has appeared uh, back on screen, uh, ready to take questions from, from the audience. And so I want to give uh, people an opportunity. Are there questions? Is there a question there, Miguel? Um, not not quite yet. And we just put into the chat box. If you'd like to uh, type in a chat uh, question, please go ahead and do so. Um, I mean, I have a I have a question. <laughs> you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, just one of the stories aspects of this story that I, I always find so fascinating is Richard Allen's role um, and and AME uh, the founding of the AME. And I always wonder sort of. What does the Episcopal Church have to learn from Richard Allen and the AME Church? Um, I can't believe you asked that question because you're in my head. <laughs> what, what, what exactly and what should be that? How do we preserve that story and that legacy? I, I don't know. The first thing that comes to, to mind for me is just this idea of collaboration because of love of Jesus, yep. which then translates into love of community and, you know, hands on. Um, that, that to me, we need to learn that because <laughs> it's going to take everybody. But can I put it even more pointedly in this regard that it, 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 it strikes me, uh, and, and as we should, uh, how we talk about collaboration with uh, the Methodist, United Methodist uh, Church, how we've been in conversation with the Lutherans, uh, yet Absalom Jones and Richard Allen started this thing out together, founded these two churches together, and they remained uh, very close friends to the end, and and what's so? What's going on with uh, us trying to uh, preserve that relationship with our African uh, Methodist Episcopal uh, siblings? Yeah, 
You know, and I, I, I don't know, uh, <laughs> but I would imagine they're, they're, they're closer to that founding, you know, how they came to be as a denomination than we are as Episcopalians or Black Episcopalians or whatever. I mean, just that the importance of that kind of work and how it began is probably more valuable to them than it is to us. And we, we yeah, could better by knowing that. I would just add, I would add the, uh, I would add the, um, they, are, they, they are able to, to, to fend off in their relationship any temptation to denominational snobbery. Right? Mm. The, the, the purpose, exactly. the purpose is larger than than denomination, liturgical proclivities, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's there's something there to be That's to right. be celebrated. Um, uh, you know, what's that wonderful line in the gospel where where uh, uh, some people are not doing it exactly the way Jesus would have done it, and the disciples get their uh, you know their uh, be in their body, and Jesus says, you know, they're doing the work, man. I mean, he honors the work, right? Not the details. He honors the work, and I, I think that sometimes, uh, perhaps in the Episcopal Church, perhaps uh, we can be a bit snobby, uh, snobby with uh, with other brothers and sisters in other denominations. And so, it, there's an invitation here, I think, to unite in purpose and and realize that we've got to come at this from from a many pronged approach. Does it say anything about race in our church? Oh, I mean, let's get let's get real a little bit. We are talking about the African Methodist. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So while um, we do have now a few wonderful questions in the chat box, I'm going to go ahead and read one of them. <laughs> um, this is about Absalom Jones and and worship. Um, you know, we oftentimes speak about uh, his moral courage and the vision of Absalom. He's also a spiritual voice as well. And so what is the spiritual legacy of Absalom Jones? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know for me, at least I would say, I don't know if those, those pieces are unrelated. I mean, I think there's a fluidity between all of that, right? I mean, I think the moral courage uh, is an expression of the depth of spiritual com uh, commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? I mean, that, that's that's the that's the rocket fuel for the for the whole thing. I think his spirituality is a basic spirituality, right? I mean, and again, it is worship is at the center, uh, and uh, and and it is is that there's a there's a robust other centeredness that he lives out uh, while being grounded in in the prayers of the church. Um, and again, I think that because he's able to to do that, his spirituality shows. That it's really robust because he's able to um, uh, to be con continually confronted by the uh, the uh, cowardice of the church uh, and the biases of the church, the superficiality of the church, and nevertheless press on. A lot of times, especially as we talk to young people these days, they want to throw the baby and the bathwater out. And I understand that. I understand it, but we don't see that impulse uh, in in Absalom Jones. So so his spirituality. Uh, seems to be, you know, down to that real taproot, which is, is that, you know, uh, you don't throw the baby and the bath water out. You recognize the sinfulness of humanity and you keep on pushing. Yeah, he, he had a particular resilience and commitment. He would just brush aside, at least it appears, um, all that, that for most of us just gets in the way of us moving forward. He just seemed to be so, so clearly focused on the gospel and scripture on Jesus that he didn't allow barriers to get in the way. And, you know, that is, that is at the heart of what we have to do in this moment. I, I, I keep hearing uh, Sandra, Dr. Sandra from, from EDS keep talking about relationships. It is all about relationships in this moment and how we are reaching out. You know, Sunday's the most segregated day in America, they say. Uh, nobody's reaching out to other communities, but yet we have a virtual moment now where you can go to an AME church. You can go down to um, St. Thomas on a Sunday and, and, and join them. We, we have a particular moment here to deepen our relationships and reach out. Um, and I hope we can grasp it. You know, something that you said, Bishop Rob, about superficiality, um, you know, I have to say, uh, so Absalom and Jones was ordained by William White. Right. 20 years later, he ordained John Henry Hopkins, 
who was the first bishop of Vermont, who wrote the biblical case for slavery, who <laughs> nobody, vote, nobody voted for him, mind you, but he was presiding bishop and became presiding bishop himself and kept us together as a church because he loved, you know, the slaveholders, hold, you know, that, so, <laughs> ooh, talk about rolling in his grave. I mean, that just, I'm sure, I, I mean, I don't know how he could not have, you know, felt something. I mean, I'm sure Hopkins is rolling around in the grave right now back there be, outside my, my, my door, my window here um, <laughs> at this conversation and that I brought him into it. But, ooh, church, that, you know, we've got this, let this me just history. say, Shannon, uh, Bishop Shannon, that Hopkins was rolling around in his grave before this conversation. He was yeah, rolling right. around in his grave when you moved into that. Yeah. He always does. And probably <laughs> especially when my dog goes out there and relieves himself. But, you know, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on his grave. Uh, yeah, we don't stop him. Um, there are many other questions, but a few of them actually center on what I know is Dean Douglas's kind of final question, which is, um, so I'm going to, Go ahead and let that go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Her lead off. On. Oh, to, to the final question. Oh, I thought you were going to. So my so actually, and we've we've uh, answered this in in uh, one way, but in light of all that we've said in the story, that is Absalom Jones. How should this church be celebrating his legacy? And if each of you can be brief on that, and we're at that time, and or or one of you speak to that, how should we be celebrating his legacy? How about if we each weigh in? Bishop Kevin, you want to start us off? So how should we? And we we're at our time, so yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we should we can celebrate him by really going deeper and looking deep within ourselves. Uh, I, I want to share one last thing, and that is, uh, if you've never done it, go into your browser and type in Kevin and Jamal. Just type in Kevin and Jamal. Four minutes of systemic racism explained. I am Kevin, um, and and it it tells a brief story about why we got to keep learning. So Kevin and Jamal, type it in your browser. Hmm, thanks. Bishop Wright, we'll go to you since Bishop uh, Brown is going to leave us uh, leave us out in prayer. Take us out in prayer. Thanks. So I, I appreciate it. I've appreciated this opportunity to, to, to be with you here, if only virtually. So I'm grateful, grateful to you, uh, Dean Kelly, and grateful to EDS uh, for convening this conversation. Thank you for doing that. I want to say before I give you my, my two things is, is that let us not let this be talk. Uh, I mean, go to EDS, uh, send them a couple dollars in the spirit of Absalom, uh, you know, go to the Absalom Jones Center here in the Diocese of Atlanta. We have the only curriculum for kids around dismantling racism that exists in the church. Uh, you know, uh, you know, send, send some dollars there. I mean, do something. Send, send some dollars to Voorhees uh, College or St. Augustine College in the, in the spirit, in the name of it. Let's, let's produce life. Uh, not just, you know, with, with, you know, more than words. So I'd, I'd say that, but I, I want to say that we, we have to celebrate uh, Absalom and therefore uh, Richard Allen because uh, you know, their, their theology and spirituality was, was that of hope. And that is, if God is not dead, then there, we have every good reason to hope. And just because the giant is big, doesn't mean the giant can't be defeated. That is one hell of a spirituality to have and, you know, muscular spirituality to have in the world. And the truth of the matter is that is who we are, that we believe that the most durable thing in the entire universe is love and all the other isms are cracking and crumbling and crashing even as we speak. So, so from them in their time, uh, and they bear witness to a God of hope. And so while this is hard and we've been not as courageous as we need to be and all these sorts of things, um, that is all true. We have missed the mark in any number of ways, and still God is still God. And still uh, anybody who is, again, who is for hatred and who wants to collude with these things, which are stealing the dignity of people, even right now, they're on the losing side. And so Absalom and Richard live that out in powerful ways, and we have to draw strength from them. Thank you for that. Bishop McVean Brown, can you respond to that and then close us out in prayer? Sure. And I'll just say very briefly, I mean, we can do better. 
we know better. <laughs> so now we can do better and, and not just, you know, pray and sing about it, but to take some actions, to give something up, you know, to say that that is, that, you know, Absalom actually means something to us and that, and more than just, you know, our thoughts. Um, before you that's, that's, up, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. let me just say thank you to each of you for joining EDS and me in this conversation. Let this be the beginning of conversations that others have inspired by this conversation to not only engage in conversation, but to do the work. And thank our, our Episcopal Church is in good hands because we have bishops like the three of you. And so I thank you for your witness and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Kelly. Now, Kelly, thank Bishop you. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Ron. Well, and so Bishop Brown will close us out in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for each breath that we take. We thank you for being God all by yourself. You don't need us, and yet you invite us to uh, be one with you, invite us to follow Jesus. You invite us to be your uh, Jesus' hands and heart in the world and feet. And we thank you, especially for those people who inspire us like Absalom Jones to, to really step into who we can be if we trust you and if we work together and have companions and friends along the way, give us greater courage, bless us with the resolve to do all that we can, to do more than we've been doing to be grounded in your love and, and active in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thanks.